computer. You, your video and your audio is automatically turned to off because this is a webinar. So you should see me, hear me and see my slides, but um, we will not um, be recording any of you all. And then, um, no, I'm seeing a question about CEUs. We're not doing CEUs. This is just really educational and uh, just a quick hour to chat about some natives. So we are Facebook living this and just for about 10 minutes, because we really wanna encourage you, if you're seeing us on Facebook Live right now, just be sure to follow our Facebook page and register on Zoom for all of our classes. It really helps us to engage with you and whatnot, to be able to have your email and have your contact information um, through Zoom so that we can um, communicate with you. You know, Facebook's great, but we really would love for you to join us through Zoom. So. Again, if you have any questions, please navigate to the question and answer section of Zoom. The chat is for chit chat. If you wanna give a shout out or say hello or talk about your favorite plants or a story, um, great place to put that in the chat if you have a question Q and A so I don't miss it. And without further ado, we will get started here. And it's get my slides, sorry about that. So for those of you that aren't familiar, we have the University of Florida IFAS Extension and we do a lot of extension. So it's not just about agriculture or like I do Florida friendly landscaping and our wonderful master gardener program, shout out to all our Seminole County master gardeners. But we also have family and consumer science. We have livestock agents. We have 4-H programming, which is our youth programming. Um, and we do a lot for the different aspects of life. So we say it's solutions for your life. And think about University of Florida IFAS Extension for various needs and questions that you might have, recipes and you know, youth engagement, like I said, because we do a lot to serve the community and it's um, agriculture, but it's not just agriculture. So check out your local extension. And of course, right now, we are encouraging you to educate yourself from a reliable science-based sources about COVID-19. Um, so right now we're experiencing a spike of the Delta variant and we are encouraged by the University of Florida and particularly University of Florida Health, which is, runs um, hospitals in North Florida. And so, um, you know, obviously part of the university and it's really important that we all educate ourselves about the virus, about vaccines and about wearing masks. So I will send you some additional information where you can read about um, community immunity, the COVID-19 vaccines and other things like that. So here's just a quick little snippet about, you know, again, the vaccine, the science behind the vaccine, side effects you might experience and um, different experiences with that. So I'll leave it at that. And um, you know, again, when I send my follow-up email, I'll include some of this. And for those of you that might be you know, interested in getting vaccinated, but you're having a hard time having conversations with your loved ones about it, we do have some great resources for you. And again, I'll put that in the follow-up email for this presentation. One other thing is that we have our surveys. So here at Extension, we always wanna make sure we're bringing to you the most effective and enjoyable um, you know, presentations and learning experiences. So I definitely encourage you after this webinar, um, probably later today, actually, yeah, it's Friday. So I will be sending it today. Uh, just a quick short survey. Please take two minutes just to complete it. And um, let me know how you enjoyed the class, what you learned. It helps me improve our classes. And it's kind of like our social currency. So of course these classes are free, but it really does help us to um, you know, improve our programming. And you'll get that today. And then in about three to six months from now, you'll also receive another survey from me that is a totally different survey. And it's just to say, hey, after our class six months ago, did you plant any native plants? Or did you think about any changes we talked about or select any of the species that we you know talked about in class so look out for that as well that's equally as important for me to kind of see if our classes had impact so definitely check that out later too so without further ado we'll begin our journey talking about plants 
Um, I am going to stop the Facebook Live in about five minutes. Again, just for any of our Facebook Livers, we encourage you to use that Zoom link to register. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a partnership program between the University of Florida IFAS Extension and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, where they came together, and this is actually in Florida state law, and they um, created these nine Florida friendly principles. It all starts with right plant, right place. And that's really what we're gonna be talking a lot about today is what are the different aspects of your site? You know, pH, is it dry, is it wet, is it full sun or part shade or whatnot? Um, and then once we get the right plant, right place right, a lot of these other aspects come, you know, as well. So watering efficiently, using mulch two to three inches in your landscape, fertilizing appropriately. We do a lot of great workshops on fertilizer here in Seminole County um, to protect our water quality and also, you know, have beautiful landscapes. I actually have one coming up on Monday and I'll chat you the link um, where you can get a free bag of fertilizer if you're in Seminole County for um, this Monday. So join us for that. Recycling yard waste, that's, you know, our composting, reusing leaves and things like that. Attracting wildlife, we are doing that with our native plants today. So, you know, really thinking about how these food webs and these co-evolutions are really interconnected and how can we support those, you know, things that are actually, you know, kind of degrading as we can, you know, continue to see more urbanization. Controlling yard pests responsibly. So we don't wanna be blanket pesticide applications for our yards and gardens, especially if we're trying to attract wildlife. We want to identify insects first and then go from there to see if it's a bad bug and if it needs treatment at all. We also want to reduce stormwater runoff, so thinking about ways that we can reduce pollution um, and protect the waterfront. If you have a stormwater pond or if you have an area, definitely, you know, vegetating that shoreline and protecting that water because once leaves and trash and debris, um, fertilizers and runoff get into our water bodies and actually mix into the water, it's very difficult to, you know, have them um, remediated and remediate and take care of that pollution. And it's also very costly. So this class today is actually um, generally created from the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. The first 30 pages or so of the book go over landscape design concepts, and the rest of the book from about page 34 on is going to be that plant selection component. So I've selected all of the native plants available in this book and then supplemented with ones that I also secretly really enjoy. My degree, I have a master's in conservation biology from the University of Central Florida. And I worked at the University of Central Florida Arboretum for six years and then started to go to Orange County to do aquatic and um, field biology as their senior biologist. And so I have a you know, stronger background in native plants and conservation. And I just think it's really great that we can actually participate in conservation in our landscapes. And so taking those plants that I've learned over the years and, you know, kind of put them into this workshop so that you can benefit to try to seek out those plants and integrate them into your landscape. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we'd want to select native plants, not only because they're drought tolerant, water efficient, you know, they're going to be saving our water, saving our aquifers, reducing runoff and pollution, you know, needing less fertilizers if they're the right plant in the right place. Um, and, you know, just overall providing that benefit to wildlife. So they really are a big bang for your buck. And so this is a great resource. And I've put in page numbers throughout the, the presentation. So you'll see which page you can reference. And after today, I'll email you the, power, the PDF of slides. So you can actually look at the slides along with the book um, as you go and as you plan your own landscape. There's another great resource here for you, which is the FFL Plant Guide application. It's more of a mobile website. It doesn't actually have an app on the App Store, but it's a great mobile website that you can search for your zip code to say, is this the right native plant for the right place? Because even though plants are native, 
they can still be in the wrong place if we don't plant them where they're basically evolved to be planted. And Florida is very diverse. We have lots of wetlands, lots of really dry areas in our sandy scrub habitats. And so it's still important to know where that plant prefers to be so that it's successful in your landscape. You can search by plant type. So it could be a tree or a ground cover, plant shape, flower color, sunshade, different things like that. And we'll kind of follow this format as we go today. So kind of saying, well, it's easy to say right plant, right place, and everybody thinks of full sun and shade, but what are we talking about? So we're talking about various regions in Florida, and it's not cookie cutter. If you look at this map, the line actually kind of almost goes north to south when we're looking at the North Panhandle region. So if you're zooming in from up there in Tallahassee, you know, you actually have a different climate than what we have here in Central Florida and Seminole County. And, you know, you can see that that line, it really is quite erratic. And, you know, that's because we have the Atlantic Ocean over here and then the Gulf over here. And so, um, you know, it does become a little bit where it cuts off South Florida down there around Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades. But, you know, there's a lot of nuance here depending on where you live in the state, if you're co close to the coastal areas or more inland. And this is really important to think about your region. And again, this is noted in that Florida Friendly Guidebook. This is different than we say like our USDA cold hardiness zones. So cold hardiness zones are actually delegated by the United States Department of Agriculture to say, yes, you can grow this plant or this crop in this zone. So for Seminole County, which again is just north of um, Orlando and Orange County, you can barely see it here on the map, but we are zone 9B. And, um, you know, that's kind of lumped in with other parts of, of Central Florida, you know, even down through Osceola. And there's nuances even within these zones. So we might be able to grow things here in, in Seminole County um, that in Osceola County might not work and vice versa. So they might have some tropical species that might be hit or miss in Seminole County. So paying attention to your zone, knowing your cold hardiness to zone is really important, even if you're selecting native plants. So what is a native plant? And again, this book does distinguish what is native and what's not because Florida Friendly includes native species, but it's not limited to only native species. So Florida, um, sorry, native plants are referred to as a plant native to Florida a species occurring in the state boundaries prior to European contact, according to the best available scientific and historical documentation. So those early botanists, and um, that's how the Florida Native Plant Society defines it. So we're just kind of using their terminology in this webinar. You also want to think about the growth rate, height, and spread of the plant that you're planting to know if it's the right plant in the right place. So even if it's a native species, we still need to know if it's a fast growing native, if it's a slow growing native, how tall is this plant gonna get? You know, if we have an overhang and we wanna plant native brown covers, you know, we need to know if it's gonna be an issue, if, even if it's just a small shrub, um, you know, or if you're looking at creating some screening around your house, um, you know, things like that, power lines, you know, even native trees can be a problem. So we need to think about what the mature height in this book shows you in detail for each species, how tall that is estimated to get, and then the mature spread in feet as well. So really important that we think about that as well. So here in the picture, I took this is a native Chickasaw plum, plum in the woods blooming in springtime um, on one of our springtime hikes. And, you know, this really has some variation and native plants do tend to be able to try to live in their, you know, their ranges. So this one it was fairly small and probably would continue to grow. Um, but, you know, you can see there can be variation even within our natives for um, height and spread. We also want to think about pH. So this can actually be a problem if you're in a newer development and you have soils that are dug out from a borrow pit that they were built, you know, digging out that stormwater pond and piling it up to fill for your home. And then, you know, they've kind of just given you the home with it. The soils are compacted 
or you know they're really high pHs, that can actually be a problem for some of our native plant species. So if you're trying to grow you know, native plants that like it acidic, and not all of them do, but some of them do, like our native azalea, it can actually stunt the plant because it won't be able to absorb nutrients. And so when we get plants that are in that neutral category between six and seven, that's where most plants like their pH. When we're out of it, and if it's a plant that does not like low pH or high pH, it's going to inhibit nutrient absorption and stunt the plant. And so it's really important that you, you know, do a soil test. And we do those in the University of Florida IFAS extension for a very affordable. So if you're thinking about spending $100 or $200 or more on a batch of native plants and some soil and mulch and all this, you definitely want to invest in a $10 soil test. Super easy. What you do is you go around to 10 different spots in your backyard and um, you could do one for the backyard, one for the front yard if you're doing you know, both just to see because there can be some variation. You're gonna grab about 10 cups, put it into a bucket, mix it up really good and take one cup full and that's what gets sent to the lab once it's fully dried out. And that is going to give you pH, which again, very important when we're talking plants and, and native plants. Um, and then it's going to give you your macronutrients and your micronutrients. And um, if you have any, you know, what they would recommend lime requirements, depending on what you're growing, you're probably not going to have to alter your soil too much if you're growing native plants. But it's really good just to know, um, especially if you're in a newer development, what's going on with your soil before you spend all that money. Now, if you're in Florida, which, you know, well, sorry, Deborah, you're in Ohio, but uh, I'm not sure what kind of soils you have up there in Ohio, but here in Florida, most of us are going to have some variation of sand. And well, why is that? Well, Florida was underwater for a very long geographic time, or sorry, not geographic, geologic time. And, um, you know, of course, what's on the bottom of the ocean is but sand. And so, Sandy combination is what I'd like to call it. So maybe if you're in North Florida, you might see little pockets of clay or sandy clay. You might have sandy loam or sandy clay, um, you know, clay loam, different things like that. And basically what we're saying when we're talking about that is we're thinking about the size of the grain of that substrate. So silt is extremely small. It's like the tip of your hair. Um, for clay, it's going to be a little bit bigger, but still very small and very fine. Sand, you can actually start to feel, and it's larger and more texture. So the water can move through sand more quickly. And that's why we do, generally speaking, unless it's like a wetland with lots of saturation, we do have a lot of percolation in our, in our landscapes, and that water dries out quicker too. Um, and so typically we recommend some kind of organic matter and, or, you know, mulch compost enhancements. But if you're working with native plants, they're surprisingly resilient and sometimes prefer the beating that we get from our heat and our sand combination. So you really have to be careful about amending your soils if you're doing native plants. Some of them thrive in that high organic material. They can grow right next to your vegetables while others, which I've noticed like beet, dune sunflower, and some of the others really don't like irrigation. They don't like it wet. So really, again, perfect candidate for our sandy soils. So when we talk about soil moisture, um, we need to think about is our, you know, is our area, do you live by a wetland? If it wasn't, you know, if you don't live by a wetland, was your property previously a wetland? because they do infill wetlands in Florida and that can lead to a very saturated landscape. Um, you know, is it well-drained or is it wet or maybe some spectrum in between? How much organic matter do you have? Are you seeing a lot of black um, or is it just like literal beach sand where it just falls right through? Well, the way to tell is when you squeeze the soil and you let it go, if it's just a little bit moist, not even that moist, if it's wet, of course it would stick together, but even just slightly moist, if you squeeze it and it sticks in a clump, that's usually indicative of a good compost, black soil, um, high organic material, where if you squeeze it and you let go and it all runs out of your hand, you probably have a lot of sand and not a lot of organic material. 
Um, and so if you have more organic material, it's going to hold the water more. It's going to, you know, that can be good for a lot of our plants. Um, but with, with natives, you know, it might be something to consider. The sources of rain, of course, or water, of course, is going to be our rain plus any irrigation that is occurring on the site. And that could be hand watering. That could be, you know, just a micro irrigation. That could be a temporary irrigation to establish your native plantings, um, or it could be an in-ground maintained irrigation system. And regardless, we always want to think of the rain as the first and primary source of our water. And any irrigation that we're doing, be it hand watering through our in-ground irrigation system, that those are supplementing what is currently being offered by the clouds and mother nature. And so just a really good frame of, of to think about water where a lot of people think of the irrigation first and then the rain is the problem to deal with. Um, so that's not the case. And then of course, erosion. So you wanna think about, you know, how much erosion is occurring on your site and that type of a thing. And thank you for those of you putting uh, things in the question and answer for me. I really appreciate that. I'm seeing somebody saying my screen's blurry. Are others seeing that in the chat if you could let me know? Um, and I will get to your questions at the end um, so that we can make sure we get through this. Some pages have been blurry. Okay, interesting. Um, how about anybody else? Are you having blurry screen issues? Because if you are, I'm gonna disconnect and relaunch. Okay, I'm also going to disconnect the Facebook Live because, again, if you're joining us from Facebook Live, we encourage you to register on the Zoom. And so next class, we'll see it in Zoom. So I'm going to disconnect that and see if that helps. Looks good. No blurry issues. Okay, so if you are having blurry, hopefully that might have helped. Um, I can just stop share real quick and then um, reshare the PowerPoint. And hopefully that helped. Let me just screen share. Thank you all for your patience. I know we're just getting into drought tolerance here. All right, so I'm hoping you can see my screen. And my, yeah, my camera is not the best. So I probably am a little blurry, um, but hopefully the slides are good. I just reconnected them. So I'm hoping you're seeing the slides and um, able to see them. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Looks like not blurry. Um, yeah. All right. So continuing with the with the fun plant discussion. Sorry about the IT issues here. Hopefully you're seeing seeing the slides good now. Perfect. Thank you for that feedback. By the way, uh, there's drought tolerance, and again, the book denotes the drought tolerance for each and every plant that we're talking about here. High drought tolerance means that if we go through a drought, typically in Florida, we're going to see that around April or May, maybe even into June then they are gonna be very resilient to that, to that drought. Medium drought tolerance, they might be okay, but they might need a little hand watering to get them through. And then low drought tolerance means that they actually, you know, are gonna definitely need help getting through that drought season. Um, so a little bit of hand watering, a little bit of extra mulch and that type of a thing to keep them going. Now, some of our native plants, you know, most of them are drought tolerant, but not all of them. And so that's why we want to take a look at that aspect as well. Okay, great. Um, and then of course, light. Everybody always thinks of, you know, full sun, part shade, full shade. And what do we mean by that? So full sun means that we have six hours or more of direct sunlight coming into that plant every single day. And so, you know, you're, you're seeing that as the seasons change, as the, you know, the light hits your house and the shadows are cast and things like that, that that plant and that planting area are still receiving six hours or more of direct sunlight. Part shade might be dappled. So maybe you have some trees, maybe you have a little, you know, blockage from your house, but they're getting three to six hours of sun 
every day. And then full shade is less than three hours um, of full sun every day. So if it's just getting, you know, three hours or less, or the shade is deeply dappled, um, that's going to be a full shade area. Maybe the ratio, I'm seeing some people mention the still blurry and check the zoom ratio. I actually am not familiar with that. Um, so I'm just gonna keep going. Yeah, thank you for the tips, but I'm not sure where zoom options are as I'm webcasting right now, so. Um, and then you also need to think about if you're planting to select a certain species of wildlife. So if you want hummingbirds, you have to plant the hummingbird natives. If you want bees or butterflies or certain pollinators, maybe small mammals or bats, you have to be sure to be planting those um, areas, you know, accordingly. Oh, and then thank you, Chris, for clarifying. So it's not my Zoom options, that it's your out there in Zoom land Zoom options. So if you're having blur issues, check your options and that might help. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Okay, so let's start talking native plants. Now, the way that I've categorized this um, webinar is we're doing full sun plants first, so that's six hours or more. Then we'll talk those three to six hours of sun species, and then we're going to get into the shade areas, and then we'll do dry and wet. So starting off with our full sun and our large trees, Again, this can be found in the book, page 35 to 37. I will chat um, the link. Actually, let me go ahead and do that now so that if you want, you could follow along. I'm gonna put this in the chat. And so that is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Plant Selection and Landscape Design Guide. And you can see I've highlighted the page numbers as well. Books offers totally for free online for you and um, sometimes offered in person at your local extension. So we have longleaf pines. Pines are great. Florida historically was covered with pine species. We have slash pine, loblolly pine, sand pines, and they these are really fantastic natives. What they do is they stay in the grass stage for several years. Once they're established, then they shoot up. And so here you can see a little juvenile, and then they're going to continuously quickly grow and shoot up. Um, you know, if you're planting pines, I recommend thinking about planting three or more. Just from a landscape design perspective, it looks nice, and they're not going to take up a lot of room. So usually you can squeeze in about three, and then that way it just kind of gives it a nice little feel to that area. They're going to self-mulch. They're going to drop those pine needles and mulch your landscape. So really a great tree. Sycamores, these are very large trees, um, you know, big trunks, big leaves, they get tall, they get wide. Um, but, you know, really, they've kind of become very popular in the landscaping community. I've been seeing them planted more often and, and often. And, um, okay, let me put it in the chat again, I think. Usually I have a, a co-pilot and I'm flying solo today. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, so yeah, sycamores, if you have a large space, they can be a great selection. Turkey oaks pictured here at the bottom and it does get that seasonal color. So I know if you're coming down from up north and you like that fall color, turkey oaks actually provide that. And they're gonna be a very kind of more slow growing but hardwood tree. And I really like when they get established, they're not going to be needing the big hurricane pruning that our live oaks or water oaks or other things like that are going to need. So consider turkey oaks and cypress trees. If you're close to a wetter area or even in a drier area, cypress trees can be great. They tend to only really create those knees when they're subject to flowing water. So if you see them on rivers or even, you know, around lakes where that fluctuation of water is occurring, they might create those cypress knees. Um, but, you know, usually if it's a well-drained landscape, they don't produce them as much. 
And then, like I mentioned, our white oaks, our live oaks, we're tending to recommend those over our laurel oaks, which are short-lived. They only live about 50 years. And so, you know, if you plant a, a, a laurel oak when you're 25 years old, uh, then by the time you're, you know, 75, you're actually going to be seeing that tree decline. And so people get really attached to trees and, you know, we don't like to see that decline so rapidly. So we recommend the live or the white oak. Yeah, and sorry about the, the top of my screen. It's just, um, let me see if I can hide that. There we go. Okay, is that better? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have medium trees, which is one of my favorites, the Eastern red bud. Um, it usually will bloom out in the springtime in this pinkish, purplish, reddish color, with just loaded with blooms. Fantastic for our pollinators. And it's not gonna get super big. So if you only have a little area, you know, this is a medium tree, um, you know, it can be planted of course in full sun, but it's definitely gonna be a great selection for our pollinators. The rest of the year, just gonna kind of be a green shrub, nothing major going on. Um, but that springtime, it really does give quite a bloom show. Southern red cedars, these are really great. If you like that kind of Italian Cypress Mediterranean look, and you're planning that design for your landscape, I would actually recommend this. So it doesn't have the really, you know, whole shape of the Italian cypress, but the Southern red cedars are going to be, you know, they could be pruned and shaped a little bit to look more like that. And they're just so much more resilient to fungus. Um, a lot of the times our Italian cypress will get a fungus and get root rot and things like that because they're used to an arid Mediterranean desert-like climate. And here in Florida, we have humidity, as we all know, this time of year, it's humid every day. So we definitely want to um, think about maybe we can plant a southern red cedar. And I like these for balancing landscapes. So if you are doing a driveway or you want that balanced look around your house, these can be great and they tend to grow at the same you know, pace. Dehoud holly. So that's pictured here on the right with the red berries. That's a really good um, food for wildlife and our birds. And these, it does suggest, you know, wet areas because you can see them growing literally on the river bank in a floodplain and they are perfectly happy with that. So if you have a wet area, Dahoon hollies are great, but they also are very drought tolerant and they can take a little bit of a dry landscape. So definitely a great tree. And then the last two, I personally love edibles. Uh, we have our Get Your Grove On class, our final in the series happening this Tuesday, and I'll chat you the link later. Um, however, we definitely have the mulberries, which we talked about this last um, week or so on that. So mulberries, um, you know, you're going to want to think about which species you want, because there's a lot of different types of that Morris species. If it's native, um, you know, it might get a little bit bigger if you want to go with a more Asian variety then it might, you might be able to get that dwarf everbearing species. So just make sure you're asking what species of Morris you're getting um, and just very calculate that height and spread that you have for your area because every mulberry is different. You wanna be sure that you have enough space for that mulberry. And if you're planting it for wildlife and it gets super big and you don't get those berries, perfect. But if you want the berries and you plant something that's gonna get the size of an oak, that could be a problem. So just again, ask what the species is. Check us out plum. Uh, don't have pictured here, but we saw on the other slide gets beautiful um, white flowering out going on in springtime around um, February and March. And it forms little teeny tiny plums that are edible for you or wildlife. And it's gonna do great in um, full sun as a medium tree. So for small trees, we do have a few options here, baccarus or salt myrtle. If you are on our coast, this is a great one because it is salt tolerant and it's found in our dune systems and our maritime forests um, along the coast. As you can see here, the monarchs absolutely love it when it's blooming and it can be trained into a beautiful landscape tree. So really a great Florida friendly, very drought tolerant um, type of tree, and you can find more on that with page 42. 
wax myrtle, you can see the one here is really fitting very well into a manicured landscape. Wax myrtles are really cool because they take it wet, they take it dry, they can be shaped into a tree, shaped into a shrub, shaped into a hedge, um, extremely versatile and tough as nails. So wax myrtle, definitely a recommendation for me over podocarpus, which typically we'll see as a hedge in our landscapes. And it also creates these waxy little berries that are great for birds and um, not as messy, I would say, as the podocarpus berries as those start to fall, you see on your sidewalk and stuff. So wax myrtles are a great choice. Um, we have wild olive on page 47. You can see on the right, top right, um, that has a nice little waxy evergreen leaf with the beautiful little white flowers popping out for our pollinators. That one's not going to be, you know, like a traditional olive. I know um, just picturing my sister asking me about, uh, well, can I eat it? Can I eat it? You know, is it edible? Um, and basem probably too. I would not recommend that, um, though it is a great native. And last but not least, page 51, our edible pawpaw. So again, for those of you edible lovers, pawpaw is a great small um, tree that you can plant, very slow growing. And it has these really cool white kind of orchid-like almost flowers in the springtime. Um, most of the rest of the year, it's fairly, you know, unnoticeable. And that's as a lot of our Florida friendly and native plants, you know, they, they might not be blooming all year, but, um, you know, when they do, they put on quite a show. And then this one in particular is followed by these almost mango-like fruits, very interesting edible plants. So for full sun ground covers, we have a lot of options. Um, of course, we have a lot of our Florida uh, native wildflowers which are great options for full sun. And I'll tell you about my recent um, authored uh, publication that I did on, it's called Concepts for Sustainable Landscape Mosaics. And it has two really great lists for, um, well, it's actually one list, but it's really long and we've broken it up into different sections. You can look at things as far as like seasonality or pollinators, things like that. And there's just so many options that can exist as a ground cover in full sun. So if you're thinking about expanding your landscape bed or maybe even getting rid of some turf, landscaping with wildflowers or these native ground covers are going to be a great option. So starting off, we have twin, twin flower on page 71. And um, we have it here pictured, it's growing in this little bed. I actually do have um, this growing in part shade. I would say it's probably getting about three to six hours of sun per day and it's doing very well. And you can see it has these beautiful little purple flowers um, that it puts out throughout the year. And so it's a nice little, gets about maybe six inches maximum in height. Store or creeping juniper, page 71. Um, so there's lots of different types of juniper. Some of them will stay really low. Some of them will get to be about a foot tall. You just want to kind of figure out what you're looking for and what you're planting. Um, again, more on page 71. And then also on page 71, you can see I took this photo here in the middle. This one at the in the bottom in the middle is called railroad vine. So it's uh, commonly grown around railroads and here this one I saw on our beach dunes and it has these beautiful little purple flowers that get about you know this big size of a, a you know couple a sand dollar or so and it's in the morning glory um, and it's actually a legume a legume family and it has purple flowers and it kind of will vine throughout the landscape and so here it's kind of solo running, but you can actually encourage it to fill out an area as we've done in our landscape. And it, it's a great ground cover um, pretty much around most of the year, depending on where you are in the state. And we have um, also lopsided Indian grass. Uh, there's a really great uh, lady who does lots of photos about native plants and stuff up in the panhandle with the Florida Native Plant Society. She took this picture of lopsided Indian grass. A lot of our native grasses are bunching. So they're not gonna be kind of running like St. Augustine grass or things like that. They're gonna be bunching plants 
that don't tend to, to branch out, they're going to reseed. And as they reseed, that's how they'll kind of colonize an area. This one's just so beautiful. It kind of tends to lop over to the side and then the um, different flowers will come off of that area. And here you can see the yellow and the little um, different whimsical parts of the flower lopping over there. And it's just, again, one of those beautiful bunching grasses that you can select for your full sun area. So thank you to Lily for that um, photo. And then also from the Florida Native Plant Society, we have gopher apple. I remember somebody mentioned they had gopher apple. So you can see again, not a very noticeable and showy plant um, where we have a lot of green vegetation, but then we get these beautiful white flowers followed by a little apple type of a fruit. And these are really loved by gopher tortoises because the plant does not get very high. Um, maybe six to 12 inches or so, depending on how old it is. And the gopher tortoises can easily just go and eat these gopher apples. So if you're close to a conservation area or you have, you know, gopher tortoises in the neighborhood, why not consider planting some gopher apples for them? And they will very much appreciate it as it's their native food source. And I had to do another page because there's so many and I couldn't fit all the photos on here for you. But we have Sunshine Mimosa, which is a fantastic native ground cover. We see this used a lot in our mediums, pictured here on the top right. Um, and, you know, around mailboxes, you know, things like that, even around trees. This is a legume. And so one of the things about legumes that's really cool is they're putting the nitrogen from the air into the soil. And so that's like free fertilizer for our surrounding plants. So planting this around your fruit trees or your other um, Florida friendly plants is gonna be really helpful for that. Um, and you know, again, we don't wanna be mowing or weed whacking right up to our trees and our mailboxes. So having a nice ground cover around those areas is great and sunshine mimosa is a good selection. Pictured here on the bottom left, we have frogs fruit. And so this is a cool one you can see growing in ditches and swales. Um, it takes it dry, but it prefers it a little bit more wet. So if you have a little swale or a depression area, this is a really good one. And the great thing is, is it provides these flowers. And so that's the cool thing about a lot of these native ground covers is they're gonna stay low, but they're gonna produce a little flower that's gonna be really beneficial for building our food web and attracting our um, insects. You can see, um, I pictured a few native wildflowers here. I took these back when I was at UCF and we have our, our native um, state flower, which is our Coreopsis and along with Gallardia. And so we planted those together and there's lots of species of Coreopsis. Most of them are yellow. There is a pink species as well. And, um, you know, really cool with the Gallardia blooms that are kind of coming up and really complementing each other. And of course in Florida, we do see a lot of yellow and purple blooms as we approach the fall. So just a really great way to incorporate that. Monarda, I know somebody in the chat mentioned horse mint and um, it has a million names, spotted horse mint. Monarda is the binomial. Then we have um, spotted horse mint and uh, bergamot. It has lots of names. So um, in any case, it kind of has these stacked and whirled flowers. And as it blooms, those bracts attract lots of wasp species and also different types of pollinators. Muley grass is another type of bunching grass. I mentioned the lopsided Indian grass, but muley grass is commonly available at a lot of our native nurseries or even our, of course, native nurseries, but even our other nurseries, sometimes we'll carry the muley grass. So definitely ask around for that one. It can be a, a more easier one to find. Gallardia, so Gallardia um, is a holdover here because they, there's some kind of controversy where, you know, might not be considered native anymore, and that is true. But, um, you know, we can still recommend it as a Florida-friendly plant. So it's 
you know, may not be something for you professionals out there that if you're doing a restoration area, you probably don't want to do that. But if you're thinking about, you know, a landscape, a commercial residential landscape, it's perfectly suitable. So we don't need to go ripping out our Gallardia or anything like that. Um, it's a, still a Florida friendly hardy plant. Dune sunflower, another great plant. Do be careful with the irrigation on that one. And that one, it's, you know, a lot of our native wildflowers will produce a lot of seed and die their annuals. Where dune sunflower is really more of a vegetatively spreading ground cover. So it can work for you in that way. A little cold sensitive, so do be careful if you're farther north. And then things in the mint family or Lamiaceae family. We have our St. John's mint or brown savory or lots of sages. We have our red sage, pineapple sage, and all different types of our native red salvia and things like that. So definitely consider that sage family for what you're doing. Part sun, we have three to six hours. Uh, we have our fringe tree, which again, quite a show in the springtime. Yopon holly, that's um, pictured here. And then we have the weeping yopon. Star anise, which I don't have pictured. And then Walter's viburnum, again, a nice show throughout the springtime. And what it'll do is it'll constantly be flowering. Um, it'll have a big show and then it'll continue to flower as well. So more about that on page 49. For our part sun, with, that's again, three to six hours of sun per day, we have lots of shrub options. So we have our beauty berry, which produces beautiful purple fruits. The flowers are a little bit not, you know, they're white and they're pretty, um, but they're not super noticeable. The fruit is really the color that you're going to think of um, when you see this plant. And then we have our wild hydrangeas. These are um, really beautiful white umble flowers, which are great for butterflies. Wild coffee, that's pictured here on the left. A great, you know, again, part shade or even more deeper shade. It can take really shade to sun. This one's very versatile. Kind of put it in the middle in the presentation, but really in life it can take a shade to sun situation. We have beautiful white flowers followed by red berries, which are great for wildlife and not to be eaten as a regular coffee that you would brew. And last but not least, we have our coral bean. Uh, this is different than the coral bean honeysuckle, which is a vine. <coughs> Excuse me, coral bean is going to be um, really like a stick in the wintertime, and then it's going to come out with these beautiful red flowers in the springtime all the way through fall. And then um, you're going to see it kind of die back in the winter. And again, great for hummingbirds if you're trying to target those, which I you know somebody mentioned them in the chat. Part sun ground covers. Think, think of your ferns. So, you know, we have here the southern shield fern which is a great one, um, you know, if it's a little bit more wet. In the next slide, I'll, I'll talk more about ferns as well. We have Kunti, which is not a fern. This is actually our only native cycad, which produces those large orange seeds, if you're familiar with those. Um, actually quite interesting, used by Native Americans in Florida. They think that they used to actually farm Kunti for processing, and uh, they would eat the tubers, but they're toxic, so don't do that unless you know, you're a historian that's, you know, well up on that. Uh, and then we have lyre leaf sage. Again, for a more wet area, your lyre leaf sage is going to take a shade to a little bit of sun and it likes it around wet areas, maybe close to a lake or a wetland. And it's going to bloom beautifully um, in the certain in the springtime and through, you know, up and through fall. And our wire grass, another great bunching grass. This one I put in the part sun, but this can take a little bit more sun as well. So if you have a full sun environment, wiregrass could be another option for you. Another desirable feast for our gopher tortoises, which are, um, you know, needing some support and our uh, our um, native habitats as our native habitats diminish. So now as we should switch to full shade, which is less than three hours of direct sunlight per day. Starting off with shrubs, we have our firebush. Again, another great one for a little hummingbird here, getting some nectar. Firebush is extremely versatile. Even though I have it in the shady area, you can plant it in full sun. So again, a lot of variation there. 
Um, it has beautiful green to even reddish flat, uh, leaves. And then it has these nice red flowers followed by a little bit of purple berries that are also desired by birds. We have the needle palms, which is here on the bottom right named needle palm for that reason. They produce big needles. So if you have an area that you don't want to go or you don't want people to enter, that might be a good um, option. They do need shade. So definitely um, don't plant these in full sun, but they're going to get those needles. So once you plant it, stay away. Um, not something you want to be relocating. So make sure you have that in the right plant, right place. And you can find more on page 78 silver or green saw palmetto. So this is our native saw palmetto. It's going to get those big above ground rhizomes and vegetate and spread over an area. So if you're planting this, um, make sure that you have, you know, enough area. And this again can also do full sun. So, you know, you can grow it in shade, you can grow it in sun, and it's extremely versatile. And then also tar flower. So these are really, um, Another option, they're very seasonal. I don't have it pictured here, and unfortunately it's not listed in our book, but something to keep in mind, really cool, it gets a very sticky substance that it actually attracts the bugs to, and then they believe it to be a carnivorous plant because it's getting those insects and maybe dropping the petals to kind of fertilize the area. Um, but they're not quite sure as to how exactly it might be carnivorous, but obviously the stickiness is helping the plant in some way. Then we have shade for ground covers. So we have leather fern. And again, this is where we can think about a lot of those ferns. So leather fern pictured here on the right, it's gonna have kind of a reddish underside and it's very hard and waxy, um, really you know, a resilient plant. And it's not something that like has that delicate fern look like maybe our autumn fern pictured here on the left where it's a little bit more pinnate, a little bit more delicate. The leather fern has more of a prehistorical kind of look to it, but again, a great ground cover if you have a wet area. The autumn fern, again, here on the left, this is going to depend on which species you select. So definitely if you're, you know, kind of being pure about your native, make sure you're asking about that. And um, that, again, is going to have a more whimsical feel from a landscape design perspective. River sage, I cannot say more great things about this plant. This will spread vegetatively. It's a native plant, of course, and it um, is in the Lamiaceae or mint family. So it's a, the sage family. And it's gonna just really spread wonderfully um, throughout your shady area and produce these little teeny tiny purple flowers um, for pollinators. So a great one. And then also macho fern, which can do a little bit really ranging from shade to sun and um, from like wet to dry. The macho fern is extremely versatile and I believe it runs native from Mexico through Florida. So it's, you know, takes a variety of environments. So we will get to uh, talk a little bit more about where to get these plants at the end. Mike, I see your question. So thinking about wet areas. So if you live on a water body, which a lot of us, I know in central Florida, we have a ton of lakes in Seminole County, Orange County and throughout. And we wanna make sure that we're using native plants to vegetate our shoreline and not creating an invasive species kind of chaos near our water bodies. So some things you might consider is our native tea tea tree, uh, which has these cool little um, kind of stacked flowers going down and it produces good food for wildlife and it's going to be creating a more of a shrub. So a shrub type tree. Uh, so you definitely want a little bit of area. They naturally grow in our wetlands or alongside ponds. So they would be a good fit. Button bush, here you can see it literally in water. So a lot of our, if it's a wet native, it likes it wet and it's going to be blooming and happy as can be when it's totally inundated. And I like button bush because it has little, it looks like little alien sphere flowers um, and the, the anthers and the pollen just kind of stands right out like that. So it's pretty cool looking um, flower. The cinnamon fern and royal ferns, these are great ground covers for wet areas. This is of course not gonna be super wet, but um, it likes it, you know, pretty, you know, wetland type of wet, page 91. 
stable miner, which I didn't uh, put here, but that's our swamp palmetto. So that's gonna really enjoy a wet area. English dogwood, so that's gonna have a nice spring flowering going on. And even though it's called English dogwood, it actually is a native. It's one of those that was probably um, through colonization kind of named that, but it is a native tree. And then if you're lakeside, canna lily. Canna lilies are great. And this is the Florida canna, which is yellow. There's another canna that's non-native that's going to be orange. So if you have your preference and, um, you know, you go with the native yellow, why not? And dry or well-drained. So it could be dry all the time, or maybe it's just percolating really well. So you have a well-drained soil. Again, southern red cedars are a great option for these areas. I didn't picture it here, but southern magnolias, those get very big. If you're in central and south Florida, that might not be a good option for you. Um, you know, it depends on where in central Florida, but once it starts getting too hot, it really is the bottom of the range for the southern magnolia. So, you know, be careful where you're planting those. Um, they don't like it so tropical. So it's more of a think Georgia, North Florida type of a tree, you know, with some exceptions. Most pines and oaks are going to be great for dry areas if you want larger trees. Of course, our state tree. I can't say better things about the sable palmetto, um, our state, state sable palm tree um, pictured here on the bottom left. You know, a lot of people spend a lot of money on our desert palm trees, which might not really like it so humid. This tree will do cartwheels when it's raining, when it's droughty, when it's high pH, low pH, um, wet, inundated. I've actually climbed on one of these at a spring, you know, where it's literally in the water. So these trees are extremely hardy, very versatile, and they'll be able to carry us into our, our future, um, uh, you know, more sustainable landscapes. And then native Simpson stopper. I love the bark on this. If you look at these Simpson stoppers, they're grown around the state. You can see them in our maritime forests where it just is so smooth and beautiful in the bark. The leaves may or may not be super notable. They have cute little um, white flowers followed by berries that are edible for you and native wildlife. So definitely one to consider. They're a little slow growing and you can kind of plant them. They don't need a lot of space in between them if you're gonna do it as a hedge. Um, or if you're going to thin it out to see that bark, just kind of consider those. And then finally, for our dry areas, as we kind of approach the end here, is the yucca filamentosa. Uh, this is going to be kind of our native yucca, or looks like more like an agave kind of. And this flower, I just saw this, I actually just took this picture the other day in my neighborhood, growing in a dry area right up against this concrete wall and it's blooming no problem. And this was loaded with pollinators. You can't see it here on the photo, um, but those white flowers come, you know, late summertime or, you know, about August and it's just loaded with great pollinators. So really a nice one to plant. You don't want this by your front door, plant it in an area where it's gonna be farther away as like a, a stately, um, you know, plant to, to see. So to your question, Mike, uh, where do I get these plants? Well, here's a couple resources for you. You want to think about Plant Ant, which is I think plantant.com or .org. I'm not sure, but just put in Plant Ant into um, you know your browser and come up with this website. And you can actually search for lots of different um, nursery listings, plant varieties. Has a great plant and nursery directory, and so definitely check that out. And I will chat the link. I believe I have it um, pulled up, which is fan.org. This is our Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And this also has a fantastic reference for our native nurseries, native plants. So the nurseries basically become a member of FAN and then they can post all the different species that they're growing. So you might have to drive, you might have to, you know, might not be your, as close as a big box store, but you know you can get these plants, um, and so if you're really you know committed, definitely use these tools and take a little road trip. It might be an hour, it might be two, but you can find those plants, and you can also just search around. You know, there's a lot of plants I didn't mention here today, 
And you can definitely um, you know, use these resources to find more and learn more. And then again, I did chat this earlier, but this is our Florida Friendly Guide to, landscape, um, to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. When I send you the PDF of, of the slides later, you can use the slides in conjunction with this link to follow along in the book for those plants that we've mentioned. And then also, you know, props to our native Florida Native Plant Society. Check them out, enjoy, you know, check out your local chapter. They do a lot online. They do a lot of cool field trips. I myself uh, have benefited from the knowledge of their members. I was um, actually involved in the turf flower chapter in Orlando during uh, to complete my master's where we did field trips and um, learned about native plants and things like that. So definitely check out the Florida Native Plant Society, check out the Florida Friendly Guidebook, um, and then check out this app, um, which is ssl.ifis.ufl.edu slash plants. And um, you can get that app or mobile website for you and you can search your, um, your zip code. And then again, just a reminder before we go to questions, I know I'm running over time, I'm so sorry, um, but I will be sending you the survey. So please complete that today. And we will be sending another survey in about three to six months to see if you've planted any native plants. And I'll also chat a link to my most recent publication and I'll follow up with a link as I email you later. This is called the Concepts for Sustainable Landscape Mosaics. This is the EDIS, UFIFIS Extension EDIS publication that I've, um, the primary author with my colleagues, Rachel and Sandra. And this has a really great um, introduction about why we would plant sustainable landscapes. Lots of really great photos that I've taken with my colleagues. And also, like I mentioned, the plant table. So the plant table um, has the, the biological or binomial botanical name, the common name, the native status. Most of these are gonna be native. Our USDA hardiness zone. So you know if it's gonna be a good fit for you know, Miami, Tallahassee, all the different places around the state, what pH it prefers, if it's wet, dry, sun, shade, heart shade. Um, and if it's, um, let's see, what do we say? P, I uh, can't remember here, but the, if you check the publication, it'll let you know all the different aspects. So check out that publication, totally free to you. Um, and now for your questions, let's see what we got here. Digital copy of the book, we've already chatted that link. So I'm gonna go to the next one. If the yard seems like there's a lot of variation, could you do a couple of cup shape, uh, a couple of cup full samples? We have some patches of lawn that are growing well and some that are not growing as well. Yeah, you can try a little landscape bed of natives and see how it goes. I really recommend that. You know, a lot of people, when they're thinking about landscape design, they want to do everything at once. And it doesn't work that way unless you have all the time and money in the world. Um, you know, we need to take it little piece by piece. And so target a zone, target an area, you know, um, take it down to bare soil and plant what you want do your mulching, and then, you know, six months later or next season, try another little piece. So you break off, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time, so we say. All right, so for the soil texture triangle slide, can you indicate which of those would count as a well-drained soil? So typically our sand is going to be more well-drained. If you have a lot of silt, if you have a lot of organic material, if you have a lot of um, clay, those tend not to percolate as well. So a lot of us do have well-drained soils because a lot of us have sand. You can do a quick little trick. So go out to your backyard, grab a handful of soil, put it into a jar and mix it up. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna see how cloudy the water is and how much sand is at the bottom. If you have a lot of cloudiness, that's indicative of silt and clay. And if you have a lot of sand at the bottom, you probably have more sand. So that's an easy way to just kind of get an idea of the texture of your soil. All right, what else do we have here? Um, what are, why is there no requirement in the ethical recognition checklist for having native plants 
It doesn't make sense to me that you have Florida Yard. So Florida Friendly is not only native. Um, we are incorporating other species that are, you know, hardy, drought tolerant, non-invasive, you know, there's no invasive species that you'll find in the Florida Friendly recommendations. So, you know, although our umbrella incorporates native plants, we also include other plants. And I don't know about you, I love natives, but I also love edibles. I love, um, you know, uh, beautiful like chase tree. Chase tree is a fantastic drought tolerant, non-invasive plant that's Florida friendly. And so our umbrella incorporates plants like that that are great. Um, however, it also incorporates natives. And so that's why we're able to bring you this class today. So I'm seeing a lot of stuff from before when we had all the blurry issues, where to purchase. Um, so actually pines, if you're looking to purchase a bunch of pine species, you can check um, the Florida Forest Service. Sometimes you can order a block of 100 pines for maybe a restoration area or something like that to try to um, contact them and see if they can get you a large block of pines. Some communities have criteria that you must plant two to three hardwood. We have oak, but want something more interesting. Um, so I would recommend a turkey oak. So I'm guessing you have a live oak or something like that. Turkey oak, great one to consider. Can native plants be invasive? If yes, you can give us an example. So native plants cannot be invasive, but they can be weedy or they can be um, nuisance. So if a site is disturbed, you might see a native starting to colonize that area. And this is a natural, if you have an area that's been wiped out by a hurricane and it's just a woodland, right? A native woodland, you'll see what we call the process of senescence in ecology, we call it. And so our native weedy species will start to colonize that area right away. So, you know, Spanish needle or Biden's alba, dog fennel, you know, these are all natives, but they, you know, are a little bit more on the weedy side. And then as time progresses and that, yeah, that woodland starts to fill in, your trees will start getting bitter, the area will get more shaded out. And so a lot of times the weedy or nuisance natives are really just the ones that are responsible pollinating areas that have been disrupted or disturbed by tornadoes, lightning, fire, hurricanes, or any other natural processes. Um, you know, thinking back into our ecological type thing. So I hope that helps you to stem. What is the name of the book you co-authored? Um, so that's actually the EDIS publication, which I chatted. So I hope you got that link. I do have a book coming out though about invasive species. It's called Plant This, Not That, a guide to invasive species. And I hope to be bringing that to you either later this year or early next year. So. Thank you for your question, Nita. Where can I buy tar flower? We talked about resourcing. Do you have any nursery recommendations? We can't recommend a specific nursery, um, but our main native nursery in Central Florida is gonna be either green images or green owl gardens, um, those type of places, but definitely uh, check out the resources. Podocarpus. So if you have Podocarpus already, you know, you don't need to switch it out. I was just saying if you're going to be selecting um, or planning a landscape. And then as we're coming here, um, yeah, so the book that I chatted, the landscape design, has some landscape design concepts in the beginning. And so you can think about those while you're planning your landscape. And with that, I'm sorry I ran about 10 minutes over, but I do appreciate all your wonderful questions and um, for you joining me today. I will be sending you the survey, so definitely complete that for me today. And um, you know, we'll be seeing you at the next webinar. Um, just to chat real quick, we have a webinar on fertilizer, our landscape fertilization going on on Monday. So check that out. I chatted it here. You can get a free bag of fertilizer if you're in Seminole County. If you're a professional, you can get some CEU credits for that. And then again, on Tuesday, we have our Get Your Grove On series, which will cover, uh, let's see, on Tuesday, a lunch and learn. We're going to be talking about 
pineapple, pomegranates, and those weird and wonderful edibles. Uh, so definitely check that out. That's going to be um, our Get Your Grove On last thing in the series, last class in the series. And um, I'm joined by a, a wonderful host of colleagues there. So Tuesday, um, Get Your Grove On. And Monday, we have fertilizer. So thank you all so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a feeling inspired to go out and plant some Florida-friendly native plants. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.